Dubliners by James Joyce, narrated by Donald Donnelly. It's bad for children, said old Cotter, because their minds are so impressionable. When children see things like that, you know, it has an effect. I crammed my mouth with stirabout for fear I might give utterance to my anger. Tiresome old red-nosed imbecile. It was late when I fell asleep. Though I was angry with old Cotter for alluding to me as a child, I puzzled my head to extract meaning from his unfinished sentences. In the dark of my room, I imagined that I saw again the heavy grey face of the paralytic. I drew the blankets over my head and tried to think of Christmas. But the grey face still followed me. It murmured, and I understood that it desired to confess something. I felt my soul receding into some pleasant and vicious region and there again I found it waiting for me. It began to confess to me in a murmuring voice, and I wondered why it smiled continually, and why the lips were so moist with spittle. But then I remembered that it had died of paralysis, and I felt that I too was smiling feebly, as if to absolve the simoniac of his sin. The next morning, after breakfast, I went down to look at the little house in Great Britain Street. It was an unassuming shop, registered under the vague name of Drapery. The drapery consisted mainly of children's booties and umbrellas, and on ordinary days a notice used to hang in the window saying, Umbrellas Recovered. No notice was visible now, for the shutters were up. A crepe bouquet was tied to the door knocker with ribbon. Two poor women and a telegram boy were reading the card pinned on the crepe. I also approached and read, 1st July 1895, the Reverend James Flynn, formerly of St. Catherine's Church, Meath Street, aged 65 years, or I.P., the reading of the card persuaded me that he was dead, and I was disturbed to find myself at check. Had he not been dead, I would have gone into the little dark room behind the shop to find him sitting in his armchair by the fire, nearly smothered in his greatcoat. Perhaps my aunt would have given me a packet of high toast for him, and this present would have roused him from his stupefied doze. It was always I who emptied the packet into his black snuff-box, for his hands trembled too much to allow him to do this without spilling half the snuff about the floor. Even as he raised his large trembling hand to his nose, little clouds of smoke dribbled through his fingers over the front of his coat. It may have been these constant showers of snuff which gave his ancient priestly garments their green, faded look, for the red handkerchief, blackened as it always was with the snuff stains of a week with which he tried to brush away the fallen grains, was quite inefficacious. I wished to go in and look at him, but I had not the courage to knock. I walked away slowly along the sunny side of the street, reading all the theatrical advertisements in the shop windows as I went. I found it strange that neither I nor the day seemed in a mourning mood, and I felt even annoyed at discovering in myself a sensation of freedom, as if I had been freed from something by his death. I wondered at this, for, as my uncle had said the night before, he had taught me a great deal. He had studied in the Irish college in Rome, and he had taught me to pronounce Latin properly. He had told me stories about the catacombs and about Napoleon Bonaparte, and he had explained to me the meaning of the different ceremonies of the Mass and of the different vestments worn by the priest. Sometimes he had amused himself 
by putting difficult questions to me, asking me what one should do in a certain circumstance, or whether such and such sins were mortal or venial, or only imperfections. His questions showed me how complex and mysterious were certain institutions of the Church, which I had always regarded as the simplest acts.